as we uh, journey through this series of uh, Route 66, there's 66 books of the Bible, and these, these books are, uh, they're telling the story of God's people. And as we hear the story of God's people, sometimes we think in terms of Walt Disney movies, and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> well, I've heard my neighbors in discussion before. I've, I've heard my neighbor speak to his son with a little bit of enthusiasm before. Any of you guys ever heard one of those? Um, I've been in restaurants and seen people's voices be raised. And I haven't lost my temper once myself, but nobody saw it, so it didn't matter. Who's Nathan? I believe this with my whole heart, that Nathan is one of the two stars of the book of 2 Samuel. The first one is God, the second one is Nathan. He simply did what had to be done regardless of his own feelings and regardless of his own challenges in life. He understood the depth of pointing a finger at somebody because three come back at yourself. You ever, you ever heard that one before? You ever wish you didn't have two fingers at that point and it was just one and one? He, he had a judgment to bring, but he brought it in a very tender fashion. You ever, you ever been confronted and you didn't even really know it? You didn't feel like it? Have you ever been confronted and all you knew that the person was ticked off? And, and as a result of that, all you did was feel bad. You didn't want to change anything because there was no compulsion inside of you to discover what was wrong. You were just sorry you got caught. Can you relate? Um, today's about a mirror. And today's about a window. You know the purpose of a mirror? Who knows the purpose? Go ahead, speak. What's the purpose of a mirror? See to see yourself. To know what you look like when you leave the house, only to look in that mirror again the next morning, right? If it's a windy day, you don't really realize that your hair gets out of place. You don't necessarily know that you got that little piece of crumb still on your cheek. You, you don't remember that you forgot to shave. You, you don't, it, there's a, but the purpose of the mirror is to take a look at ourselves. And there's people in this world who, when everything is going great, this is what they love to do. It's all about them. How many of you have ever seeing a whole bunch of things go good, and you're like, oh, I'm looking good. <laughs> but you know what? This is, all that, this is all that Nathan did. All he did was walk up to David and say, look. That's all he did. He used a very creative story. Then there's a window. I purposely didn't wash this, okay? You know, the purpose of a window is to look out. To look out. You see, in simplicity, David realized his sin by looking in the mirror. And he realized the goodness of God by looking through the window. There's no hope when he's looking here. And there's an abundance of hope as he's looking this way. If you've ever run a company, if you've ever had a wonderful family, sometimes look at the mirror and say, aren't I doing a great job? When we should be looking through the mirror and saying, you, you should be looking through the window and saying, you guys are making us great. And when things are wrong, we ought to be looking in the mirror and saying, this company's not doing good because of me. It's my leadership. The fault is mine. We often get the window and the mirror mixed up. 
David's use of the mirror showed sin, failure, shortcomings, and lack of obedience to God. But immediately after looking at the mirror, he looked through the window and he realized God's forgiveness, God's love, God's grace, and God's mercy. And if you take a look at the book of 2 Samuel, realize that there's this incredible journey of the realization that God has been good and I want to be good to him and I'm thankful for all that he has given to me. 2 Samuel chapter 11 tells part of the story. Here's the, here's the story according to scripture that uh, Dan just act out. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. He sent to them and he slept with her. She had purified herself from uncleanliness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite and Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to the house, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. We got one in obedience and one in disobedience. When David was told Uriah did not go home, he asked him, haven't you just come from a distance? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark in Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my master Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open fields. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. That's David's confrontation there. That didn't go anywhere. But Nathan's finger did. You, you, you ever been humbled and you weren't looking at it and it just kind of hit you big? I mean, I mean, right here, we're still seeing the hardness of David's heart. Then David said to him, stay here one more day and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next at David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went to sleep on his mat as among his master's servants. He did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it to Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. <gasps> So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at the place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in, the, in, the, in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, when you have finished giving the king his account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up and he may ask you, why did you come to get so close to fight to the cities? Who killed Abimelech, son of Jerobosheth? Didn't a woman who throw an upper millstone around the wall on him? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you, then say to him also, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. The messenger sent out, and when he arrived, he told David everything Joab had said to him. The messenger said to David, the men overpowered us and came against us in the open, and we drove them back to the entrance of the city gate. Then the archers shot arrows at your servants from the wall, and some of the men died. Moreover, your servant, Uriah the Hittite, is dead. Wow. David told the messenger, say this to Joab, don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. 
Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. When Uriah's wife heard about her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done was displeased the Lord. David's still looking in the mirror at how great he is. He, 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 he's missed something here. The truth is, is that we need to learn to look in the mirror. You know, this is, a, this is part of the story of God's people. And, and, and I stand here to tell you this. God's people are not perfect. We're just forgiven. Would you say that with me? God's people are not perfect. We're just forgiven. Wow. I love forgiveness. I love the removal of guilt. I love the idea of just kind of coming clean, and I've had a lot of practice. I love the idea of forgiveness. There was a sports editor who was given the opportunity to uh, write an obituary for a lady in town. It was a small town, and there wasn't anybody else there to write it, and so he went around town asking people about her. He said, hey, do you know a Mrs. Smith? Uh, what do you know about her? And I need, I need to write an obituary about her. And he, he just, he, he didn't find a whole lot out. He, he spent two days doing this, and finally it came time to submit the article, and this is what the article said. Mrs. Smith, no hits, no runs, no errors. <laughs> Simply put, she hadn't done anything great. She hadn't made any mistakes. But she, she, she just sort of existed. So I think a great question for you and I would be this, is that um, when, 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 when we look into the mirror, what do we see? And when we look out at the mercies of God, what do we see? Do we see hope? I love hope. You know what it's like being caught red-handed and then being caught red-handed a few minutes later? You ever, you ever receive multiple spankings in one day? It, 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 it's real. But I guess the question is this, is that, so what's the real story about David? Is he a hero or is he a jerk? <laughs> yes. Is he a sinner and is he forgiven? Yes. Did he blow it big time? Yes. Did he um, write incredible psalms? Yes. He's a very complex guy. Let me give you a little overview of, first, of 2 Samuel that I wrote. It says this. 2 Samuel is about King David, the second king of the monarchy. We're introduced to David in 1 Samuel when the second king was being appointed. He's the son of Jesse, and he has seven older brothers. He's a shepherd and would be called an obedient little boy as he followed his father's instruction by taking care of the sheep and taking some supplies to his brothers who were at war with the Philistines. He's a champion fighter who has killed a bear, and he's killed a lion barehanded. And he also does not fear the giant Goliath and kills him as well. He's a musician and is known to be the one who calms the nerve and ministers to the king Saul through music. He writes compelling poems to God about God and clearly adores the heavenly father. He is friends with, John, with Jonathan, Saul's son, and is loved by the nation of Israel for killing Goliath. And it is loved by who he, he is loved for who he is by his friend Jonathan. The first 10 chapters of 2 Samuel show him as a victorious warrior. Describe him as being praised by the people, having incredible compassion for the sick and the poor, and being righteous in God's sight. We see him dance before the Lord in the streets of Jerusalem as the Ark of the Covenant is brought home. He cares for the son of, he cares for the boy Mephibosheth, the crippled son of his best friend Jonathan. After Jonathan dies, and yet the pages of 2 Samuel also share the misguided steps and tragedies of this great hero, including his adultery with Bathsheba, the cover-up and murder of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. It includes the death of his son, the political overthrow of David by his own son, Absalom. In all of this, David is known by his heart, 
a repentant heart and is called a man after God's own heart. David is far from perfect and so are we. The question we should apply to ourselves is how do we see ourselves and how do we see the goodness of God? Credible man. Let me just say this. Uh, uh, David is to be admired. He is. And I think Nathan admired David in many ways. He killed Goliath. He wrote the Psalms. He was respectful and a terrible, to a terrible man named King Saul. He had an incredible friendship. Okay? He cared for Mephibosheth, the crippled son of Jonathan. He wants to worship God. And so he buys a threshing floor at one time to make a sacrifice because it's not a sacrifice if it's not a gift from himself. But at the same time, he ought to be shunned. He fails to go to war with his men. He sees Bathsheba and he doesn't stop his selfish sexual desire. He pursues Bathsheba. Even though she's knows fully aware that he is that she that she is married, he finds out she's pregnant. He tries to cover up his intimate activity. He f- falls so far into sin that he takes her hus- takes her husband's life, Uriah. That's not the kind of person who wins awards that say best Sunday school student. Is he? He's not the kind of guy who ought to be wearing a badge that says a man after God's own heart. Selfish sexual predator. You know, but, but I want you to know this. David hates sin. He hates sin. When, when Nathan asks, he speaks strongly about selfishness and sin. He knows about sin. Uh, David declares the strong consequences of sin as well. He speaks of severe punishments for wrong behavior and bad choices. He makes no bones about discipline and punishment. And David seeks the miraculous forgiveness of God. If you have a Bible, would you, would you, would you pull out Psalm 51? If you don't have a Bible, there's probably one right in front of you. There's not going to be anything on the screen. I thought that maybe having our Heads bowed while we uh, look down as we look at this passage. Because this is a passage that shows us the incredible window that David looks out and he sees God Almighty. There's phrase after phrase of shame. And there's phrase after phrase of hope. He's going back and forth from the mirror to the window to the mirror to the window. And it's just this incredible thought of, I got no hope. I have incredible hope. I'm in trouble. God loves me. Have mercy on me. That's a great place to start. Oh God, according to your unfailing love. If there was ever a time to be looking for the joy of the Lord, it's now. According to your great mercy, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. He, he, he's not even a full sentence into this, and he's already, he's already made three incredible proclamations. God's mercy, his unfailing love, and a need for that being a part of his own life. He's just getting warmed up. Verse 2, wash away my iniquity. How many verbs, adverbs, And adjectives can you think of that are for the word sin? And how many can you think of that are for the idea of a little bit of hope here? (laughs) Incredible list. He should be an English teacher. Wash away all my iniquity. At that point in time, he's probably in his head going, one, two, three, four, 8,006, 8,007, 14,556. And cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. Are you, are, you, are, you, are, you, are you seeing him look at the mirror? Are you seeing him look out that window? My sin is always before me. Gosh, he's looking in the mirror there. Against you and you only have I sinned. He's still looking in the mirror. I've done what is evil in your sight. So that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge, 
Surely I was sinful at birth. He's still looking in the mirror there. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. He's looking, he's looking out the window there. And he's seeing hope. He's seeing a hope that God loves. He's seeing a hope of God's joy. He's seeing a hope of God's forgiveness. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop. He's looking out the window because he's capable. If you don't know what hyssop is, it's, it's a little stronger than ivory soap. We're, we're, we're talking the real deal there. Anybody ever, anybody ever been so sick that you like have gargled with something like vinegar? I'm not talking about nice taste. I'm, I'm talking about something that's going to do some work in there. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. He's seeing God's hope here. That's a proclamation of hope. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. <laughs> Man, he's, he's looking out the window and he's going, dear God, help me. <laughs> help me. Help me see the, oh, God, you're so good to me. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and block out my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart. Oh, man, this is, this is incredible as David looks out the window and sees the hope that there is in a relationship with, with the Lord. And renew a steadfast spirit in me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. He's looking through the window stronger than ever right there. And he's seeing the incredible, incredible forgiveness that God gives. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing heart to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. This is, to me, this is the best part of this whole little thing here. That's when he says this. I'm going to learn to hold the window. I'm going to learn to hold the mirror up at the right time to people. And I'm going to tell other people about looking out the window. Because there's no hope and there's an incredible hope. As believers... We often stop when we get to this part. We stop when we get there and we say, I don't have any story to tell anybody. Your story of God's grace is the greatest story of witnessing that exists. Restore to me the joy of your servant and grant a willing spirit. Then I will teach your transgressors your way and sinners will turn back to you. Starting with me. Save me from your blood guilt, O God, and the God who saves me and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I will bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. You know, in the Old Testament, it actually says that there's a beautiful aroma of burnt offerings to God. But that's not his first choice. There's this uh, singer in college who was a Christian artist named Keith Green. Anybody heard of Keith Green by any chance? Keith Green had an incredible song. I sing it often. I want more than Sundays and Wednesday nights. That was the song. You know, the goodness that you can have in singing here on a Sunday morning with, with other believers is a goodness you can have at home as well. It's, it, it's not reserved for an hour a week. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, oh God. And what he's saying right here, this, this is the amazing part of this window. What he's saying is, God, you, you've seen it the whole time. And I'm seeing what you see. 
and I'm also seeing what you see out here. And he's putting it all together. That these two things have to go together. They're not separate from one another. And then he ends in saying, In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. I want you to know that he realizes in verse 18 that his sin is consequential for the entire country. Wow. We're going to be jumping into the book of 2 Kings First and second kings. And one of the great themes of first and second kings is this. When the king did well, the country did well. When the king did well, the country did well. And David realizes this. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls. Then there will be righteous sacrifice, whole burnt offerings to your delight. Then bulls will be offered at the altar. I want to close a little bit differently today. Have you looked in the mirror lately? Not a great sight. But have you looked out the window? Have you looked out the window? God is good. You can finish that statement if you'd like to. And all the time. He's good and don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget the absolute joy and admiration. God is good. No matter how bad that mirror looks in the morning, God is good. As we, as we close in, 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 a, in a song here today, you know what? I just want you to have the opportunity to simply say to God, thank you for what's on the other side of the window. <laughs> And, and thanks for making the mirror a little bit better looking today. <laughs>